your goal is to go out and draw that data trace in the car. With your foot. With your foot, right. <laughs> in between the big yes. toe and the other right. toe, and then right. that's that happens at 150 miles an hour. And if you can't, you fail, you die. Right. In death. Yeah. Also, I just gave you another compliment. You have to say, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Thank I'm you. I'm sorry. Thank you. There You're you go. welcome. Yeah. Yes. I'll come back to Jeff and go, Jeff, you know, I noticed, you know, our car does this <laughs> and their car does that. And for people who aren't watching the video, one of Ross's hands, when he said this, went up and went wiggle, wiggle, wiggle. And when he said that, another hand went up and went wiggle, wiggle, waggle. And that's very different. And if you've ever stepped inside of a racetrack, you know the difference. You know, if I was Billy, I would tell my friends, my family, just ask questions, whatever pops up. Like, why do you always check your tire pressures before you go out? Now Billy's Daddy, why to... do you crash every lap? <laughs> <laughs> well, that could be one too. Hi, it's Sam. This right now is a commercial for the podcast that you're already listening to. Is that weird? I don't know. Podcasts are weird. I'm sorry to interrupt, and I'll keep it short. So we have this thing called Patreon. You go there, and for a few bucks a month, you get to help support the show, but you also get neat perks like future bonus episodes, access to regular live Q&As with the three of us, and some rad speed secrets training from Ross. The money we raise through Patreon goes toward keeping the show on the air. Mostly, it lets us pay our producer, Mike, and kibble and shoelaces and whatever the hell else really nice guys from California eat when they're not editing podcasts. Now, should you spend a few bucks on this? Well, even a single month of support would help the show keep going. But we're not the boss of you, and that's okay. We're just glad you're listening, you know? Join at patreon.com forward slash not the car. Back to the show. Welcome back to It's Not the Car, the only podcast guaranteed to make you, well, let's just say guaranteed to make you faster. I mean, if that's what you want, it's also, I mean, we can guarantee to make you slower if that's what you want too. For some reason, I don't know why anyone would want that. Really, we're just going to give you whatever you want. We're, we're here to please. We're eager to please. Jeff, do, are you eager to please? I am. I am. Uh, and I'm really okay. good at making cars go slower. So, Cool. Cool. That's pretty much all I specialize in. It's all I've really ever done. Um, today, Ross, oh, hi, are you there, Ross? I'm in your hi. house, by the way. I, this is, we're coming to you, well, not live, but live to tape from Ross's house because I'm visiting Ross today. I'm in one of his offices. He's in the other office, which means that I get to sit here and poke out all of his books, which means I'm holding in my hands a copy of Technique des Rennfahrens, Der Werk zum Erfolg, and I apologize because my German is genuinely terrible, but it's the German language version of Speed Secrets with a foreword von Craig T. Nelson, the famous actor from Malibu, California. Um, no one wants to hear the rest of that. So today is something that'll be familiar to some of you, probably a lot of you. We're bringing this in from Ross's old Speed Secrets podcast, something he and Jeff used to do called No Dumb Questions. It was a 40-minute show they did for a couple of years, and the point was questions about engineering, questions about driving and coaching that all came from listeners. And it was always, the goal was always to explain it for ordinary people, to not shy away from tech, but the whole point is that these topics are really genuinely interesting for just about everybody. And they just have to be presented in a certain way. Right, guys? Exactly. Yeah. And, and we have fun. That's I the mean, most important part. I mean, you say that. Every single episode, you said you have fun. Were you really having fun? Well, it depends on uh, how, many, how many times you insulted us Canadians. Canadians are lovely people. Why would I do right. that? I'm sorry. Ah, you are yeah. sorry. You should yeah. be sorry. Look yeah. what you've yeah. done. Oh, that thing with the moose and the maple syrup? You should be sorry. Okay, so today, basically what we do is we, hear, we read the question, comes from a listener, and then it turns into answers and conversation. And I'm going to sit here and ask silly questions because I don't always understand things that happen because Ross and Jeff are both very smart and I write for a living. So we have, our first question comes from Greg. It's about data. The question is, a phrase I've heard countless times in racing and have even said myself is that the data doesn't lie. This is referring to the concept that data, remember all modern race cars and professional leagues have data systems. They record everything that happens, record everything that the driver does, what the car is doing, how extensive those data systems are, and whether or not those data systems, the data is available. How much of it's available later varies from series to series. But 
He's asking, the concept that data recorded on a modern and properly set up acquisition system can sometimes contradict what a driver says about a given car's behavior, a given situation, or anything else. What are some situations or examples of when the data isn't lying, but also when it isn't telling the whole truth? In other words, why is it important that we not blindly trust data all the time? And I think the first answer is, well, because if you trust the data all the time, you end up with Skynet and then robots around the world and everybody dies. <laughs> why, why is that important? Jeff, what, what, unpack that. Um, that's, that's actually a really good question that comes up a lot more often than a lot of people would think, you know, we're, I'm luckily lucky enough that my day job is to deal with, I, I usually have world-class drivers driving for me. So a lot of times th what they think, what they feel drives how we look at the setup and the data just helps us decide what to do to give the drivers that feel. If you're, it, so there's where the, where the drivers feel would kind of supersede the data. We could talk about it more in detail, but there are times when you have a more of a beginner driver. Um, and Ross can probably talk about this, the, where you have a coach and you're working on driving technique where you have a lap run by a professional driver or your coach and you're comparing the data between the newer driver and the coach and there the data doesn't lie you know if the coach is breaking 50 feet deeper that's not a lie it's actually happening it might not tell you how to do that that's where the coach has to come in and explain how to break 50 feet deeper because the the new drivers are like, I'm going to die if I do that. And the coach is like, no, you're not. Here's how to, here's how to actually make that happen. But the data is real. That's so the data doesn't really ever lie. The trick is to understand when you should make a change either to your driving or the car setup based solely on the data or the, the driver. And I found a lot of times, I think people would be amazed that the more professional a driver you have and the more the better he is at relating what he needs to his engineer the less the data drives that decision on what's uh, on what he needs so we can talk about that more in detail but what do you think ross i mean you know you deal with that a lot with your Jeff, and I mean, I think one of the things that uh, separates you from some other engineers that I've worked with is I think uh, some engineers, their default is whatever the data says uh, is going to take precedent over what the driver says. I think you have always been, you know, if I'm getting two kind of slightly conflict conflicting uh, messages here, you tend to lead to lead uh, lean to the driver mm -hmm. and think it's one of, personally, I think that's one of the things that makes you successful. And I think, you know, one of the things that Greg said is data never lies, but and this is the part that I always come back to is it doesn't give you all the answers. And to me, all data does is it helps you, it helps you clarify what questions you should be asking. Because yeah, I mean, if you have two drivers and one driver is breaking later than the other driver, you have to ask the question, well, why are they doing that? And, and then is it the right way to break? Like maybe breaking earlier gets you out of the corner better, uh, or carries more speed in the corner. So, uh, all it does, all data does is just help you generate better questions is the way I look at it. Yep. Yep. How, okay. So one of the things I've noticed, so we've talked about my deeply unillustrious and thoroughly without, um, prestige club racing, not a career for, uh, whole seconds on this show, which is just about whole seconds longer than anybody needs to hear about it. But one of the things I've noticed in my, my exposure to data in that environment and also my exposure to data in car magazine testing, where we use it in a very, very, very simple manner, right? It's always which cars carry, you know, across one control driver on one control day, you know, assuming that all else is equal, which it really isn't, or never is. 
you know, we use it for, you know, this tire, this car, this situation, when cars carrying more speed on entry, under braking, you know, loses coming th- less in this situation, yada, yada, yada. One of the things I noticed was, and, and frankly found really frustrating before I learned to stop trusting my gut on what was quicker was that there are situations where, you know, a car, you'll change something about a car's balance. You'll change something about your own driving and it will feel faster, but the data will show that it is not. And the data will show like you'll, you can even, it'll feel faster and the lap time might be lower, but it might be because subconsciously, you know, you have somebody compensating across the rest of a lap for the fact that it was quicker in one moment and slower in the other. And that all adds up to a lower lap time, but that doesn't mean the change that you made either in driving or in setup led to that. Right. And what I found really interesting was teaching myself the process of teaching myself to not trust my gut in so many cases. What I'm getting to is you would assume that most storied pros with a lot of experience, when they come in and say, oh, the car's quicker here or that this is working better, it is. And the data backs that up. But how often, how often is that true? How often do you get somebody who has a gob of seat time, years and years of seat time across multiple different chassis and multiple different environments? And, you know, they say something and look at that and like, well, actually it was slower here. And, you know, how often does that happen? Hmm. I would say not very often for me anyway. Okay. It's, and again, I'm going to say the same thing, Jeff, uh, at, at, at that level, yeah. no, at the top levels, uh, and, and sorry to, sorry to jump in here, but no. you know, one of the things that I work with drivers on is calibrating your feel to the data yep. and, and, and actually like practicing, okay, get out of the car, give yourself, you know, kind of go through the debrief, make your notes, make your thoughts, get your thoughts all down and then compare it to the data. And then look at the data and see where there is uh, a, a non-agreement, and 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 then use that as a learning tool. So yep. then you know if the data is saying this, and you go, oh, okay, I can see how that is. So over time, that's how those drivers, the top drivers, that's how they became so good to the point where Jeff doesn't need to look at the data anymore. You can just <laughs> listen to the driver because the driver is so well calibrated to it. That's so cool. hundred percent. I would, uh, our, so my last year running LMP3 was 2022. And I would say there were at least half of the races. No, it might've been all the races, but most of the races, I didn't even look at a data trace all weekend. Didn't even fire up the computer and look at the data at all. Just purely went by driver feel. Now, I had the same driver for, well, I was going to say 10 years, but 30 years really, because it was my kid. So I <laughs> yeah, knew, yeah. What, <laughs> you know, so I knew what he needed. I knew what he wanted. He could explain it to me in great detail. I didn't, you know, the process would be, I need the car, the car understeers too much here and here's what it does and here's what it feels like. And instead of looking at the data to figure out what was causing that understeer, I could just ask some more questions. I'd be like, okay, so how's the initial turn in? Well, it turns in really good initially, but the next car length, it starts to give up. And what happens when you add some more steering? Yep. It, it won't take it. It just blows through the tire and I have to come back on the steering, straighten it out, get the tire to recover and then go again. Does it feel like it pitches too much? And I can, I won't go through all the questions, but I could ask three or four more questions and know what needed to be changed in, and then we just change it and go on. In other instances, we might go through that same process and then I could look at the data and go, okay, so why is it blowing through the tire? Is It's probably too stiff. Hmm. I wonder if we're on the bump rubbers. Look at the data. Nope, we're not on the bump rubber, so I won't change those. Hmm, I wonder if it's rolling more than normal. Nope, look at the data. Nope, it's not rolling more than normal. I think it just needs a stiffer spring. So the data kind of helps you look at what change might give the driver the feel that he needs. And to me, like Ross said, it's just my style, but ultimately I know that if I can give the driver 
a car that feels the way he wants it to feel, he will extract the most that his talents will allow out of that car. Because if the data says, or the simulation says, this should be what we should change, and the driver doesn't like that feel, he's not going faster. He's uncomfortable. He doesn't want to press the limit. So I always look, try to get the, I reverse it. What does the driver need? Understand that really, really, really well, just from the driver. Now use the data to try to help me give him that feel. And so the data doesn't lie, but it doesn't drive the direction of the decision of what to change. It might drive what we're going to change, but all ultimately to give the driver what he needs to have the car feel the way he wants it. And and Jeff, like uh, another example of, and this is where the data helps the feedback, uh, and sometimes we'll correct a driver's feedback is you can get a driver that comes in and goes, ah, the car is really loose. Like I go to power or halfway through the corner, I go to power and the back end comes snapping out and it's just, it's trying to kill me. And you know, you look at the driver and you can see it in their eyes. They're thinking, my God, I'm cheating death here. I'm going to die. This is going to be terrible. And you, you, if, if, a because that's the thing that's going to kill the driver, they think, <laughs> That's what they're focused on. So then you look at the data and you look at the steering trace and you look at the drivers put this massive amount of steering angle in. They've created this big amount of understeer. The car plows, 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 and then the front end hooks up and snaps sideways. And the driver was focused on the oversteer, but it was really actually caused by the understeer earlier in the corner. And, you know, one of the things, I mean, I've heard you do this, Jeff, like a lot of times... I've sat down and asked the driver, okay, well, what do you want the car to do better? And the driver goes, well, I want it not to oversteer at the exit of the corner. And you could just walk away with that and go, okay, let's go fix it oversteer. But unless you ask the question, again, I've heard you say this, ask this, Jeff, is, yeah, so what are you doing when that happens? What have you done just before that? And hopefully the driver goes, oh, I got a bunch of understeer before that or some amount of understeer. Well, then you can look at the data and if you've got a steering trace, you can then look at that and go, yeah, it's caused by the understeer. The understeer caused the oversteer. So that's a case where the data is not lying. uh, And in fact, the driver's not lying, but the driver didn't give you the whole story either. How (laughs) how easy is that reprogramming process, right? You know, Ross, you mentioned having to to calibrate kind of your internal, not not your butt dyno, but, you know, your internal kind of... um, hell, what is it? Uh, the thing where you, you pull it on a string and it spins. Gyro. Your internal gyro, right? Trying to calibrate your internal gyro to match what the data says. And I'm assuming, you know, it varies with talent and certain circumstances, situation and seat time. But like if you had, you know, the average human and you had to teach and they had moderate skill on a racetrack, is that a matter of a couple of weekends? Is that a matter of an entire season? And and it varies with resolution, like how, how finely you want to be able to tell them that. I mean, Jeff, when you, you know, when you did that with Colin, did Colin just kind of the way he came up, just kind of pop out calibrated that it, it worked? What's that process like? I don't really remember that process. It was, you know, but it must have happened somehow because I mean, he he can, and not just him, many drivers I work with, again yeah. at that high world class level, almost do the data themselves because they'll they can come back in and say. Hey, you know, we were just at Daytona or whatever. Turn, exit of turn three, I'm down one tenth on my best lap. Uh, through the kink, I pick up a little. Uh, breaking into five, um, a little worse into the corner, but it translates and coming off, I'm two tenths ahead because they're watching that predicted lap time. They use that predicted lap time on their dash as a calibration tool on how they're doing in each corner. But if I change how I uh, how I approach turn five and I do this with the pedals and this with the steering and and carry a little bit less min speed and be really patient in the center, I'll come off three tenths ahead. But if I rush the center too much because of the understeer, I'll come off two tenths behind. And they give me that kind of stuff. And I can look at the data and it's all true, but we can skip that step and just go straight to, to fixing it. And the, the key to it is, We'll get times when a driver might say, hey, I did turn five two different ways. I think the second way I did it is better. 
let's look at the data and see and see what it what it correlates to. And we might go, yep, it, the second way you did it is better. You're consistently a tenth quicker off, you know, off that corner to turn six. And so the drivers can use the data to help verify some things that they aren't sure of. And that helps back to your question, that helps them calibrate the data to the actual, to what's actually happening. And, and Sam, to further, further answer your question, you know, how long does it take? It takes just long <laughs> enough, <laughs> uh, but, but or the, it takes too long and then you find another job. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Ross goes I, to the next I, client. <laughs> I, I, I'm going to say, I mean, so much of it comes down to how you, how you work on that ability. I mean, it is a skill like, it's a skill like how you apply the brake pedal. It's a skill like, you know, if you're a tennis player, it's a skill like practicing your backhand. You can deliberately, you know, tennis players go to the court and they have a ball machine hitting the ball to their backhand side and they hit backhand, 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 backhand. They're very deliberate in how they practice that. A lot of drivers go, I just need more seat time. So they go and they drive around, they drive around, they drive around, they drive around, and they don't get a lot of the feedback in that specific area. You know, I I have seen Jeff work with a relatively newish driver and learn more about how to give feedback and how to read the car in one day with Jeff because really? Jeff asked the right questions <laughs> than they ever would in like, so yeah, you could go out there and you could spend 10 years getting seat time. But if you deliberately work on that and, you know, I've had drivers where I will have them, okay, finish a session, draw me what you think the speed trace, mm. the brake pressure trace and the throttle trace is going to look like. And then let's compare that to the real data. And, you know, then you start to look at the discrep discrepancy between the two and the driver learns, okay, when I felt that actually the data was more like this and eventually you could almost do away with the data system and just trust what the driver is saying, but you have to practice that. You have to build those skills in a very deliberate way. Otherwise yep. you're just randomly out there driving around getting seat time. I'll say that again, now we're kind of switching. And I think maybe the, what I've learned from this discussion is that the answer to Greg's question kind of depends on the skill level of the driver. Because I, I've worked with Ross before and with a driver and we've, you know, we have whatever, a handling problem with the car where a lot of engineers will look at the data and go, yep, it's definitely understeering. Okay. I got to fix it somehow, bar, spring, rake, whatever, to try to fix that. And Ross and I'll work together and Ross will be looking at the data with his driver. I'll be looking at it. We'll be talking to the driver and Ross will go, whoa, no, Jeff. Put your tools down. Don't change anything. The I the driver's not using the right technique. It's just going in there carrying way too much speed in and just cranking the wheel. No car in the world's ever going to hold that. It's let me let me fix the driver first, and then Ross will work with the driver to try to get them to make the car handle better and go faster. Obviously, but. I think a lot of people end up changing things when a driver technique will fix it. And then Ross will get, you know, or I've worked with him before. He's like, yeah, no, he's doing it right. I mean, that's, I think we need to change the car. That really it's your helps. your turn, Jeff. <laughs> yeah. That really helps me because I understand and it helps everybody because we're not going down the wrong path. We're not trying to fix, you know, I can put whatever springs in it you want. If the driver is going to still drive it the wrong way and just charge the corner and crank the wheel, I'm never fixing that. And so that's where you have to know what to, what to believe and what not to believe. I've seen Ross go, throttle stuff is interesting. We've worked together and he'll go, you know, we'll look at a driver's throttle trace coming off a corner and Ross will then say, okay, here's what it needs to look like. Here's a better way to handle this. And he'll draw it on the whiteboard or, you know, whatever, and then say, okay, now, your goal is to go out and draw that data trace in the car and he'll work with them with your foot, with your foot. Right. So <laughs> like yeah, the exactly. in between the big yes. toe and the other right. toe. And then right. that's, that happens at 150 miles an hour. And if you can't, you fail, you die. Right. Death. Yeah. 
Yeah. Well, and the goal is to make the trace look like Ross wants it to look like using the throttle pedal. And, and I've seen it, you know, so there's where the data doesn't lie. And if the data driver can get a mental image of what that trace needs to look like, he can try to recreate that with his foot and then come back and look at the data and see and get better. So it's, it's a, it's a valuable tool, but uh, like probably most tools, you got to use it the right way. It's not the end all and be all. There's been a lot of times where I've said, you know, look, closing the laptop, the answer is not there. Yeah. So, so, so that leads me to ask, right? So at, at, at that level, at the upper echelons of motorsport that you guys work in, how often, how common is it to go down a rabbit hole, a goose chase? There are a thousand terrible metaphors I could throw in. I actually, I guess they're images. This is what I get for having a literature degree. I don't even know what I'm talking about. But how often do you go down a path that doesn't work out based on something you see in the data? How often do you chase something that the data suggested that doesn't end up being real? Is that just deeply rare because you guys are so experienced and have done it so much? Or is that just, it happens to everybody. It's just, you know, it, sometimes yes, sometimes no. Uh, that's a loaded so, question. <laughs> Might not yeah, be. Yeah. making faces like, ooh, ah, well, hmm, tell I, me how I've sucked. No, I'm not going to do it. <laughs> nope, no, nope. All of my decisions are always great. You go first, Ross. <laughs> Okay, I, uh, so a couple of things, Sam. Uh, first of all, I think, yes, Jeff and I have worked with a lot of world-class, top-level, elite, whatever you want to call them, professional yeah. drivers. But we've also worked with a lot of drivers that are relatively new to the sport. And so not just, so I think looking at this from a, from a not, I'm going to say the better, the more experienced, the higher the level the driver the less the data, personally, I think the less the data, uh, the less important it becomes in some ways. I think earlier on, data becomes a tool to kind of, again, direct some questions and maybe clarify what the driver is saying and try to dig in a little deeper. And so I think it's a really good tool from that perspective. Uh, yeah. as, that's, just as a, that's interesting because I, I didn't mean yeah. it as a driver. I meant as solving an engineering problem right? The car's doing something that we can't get out of it. And the data leads us in the wrong direction. I Forgive me. I'm so sorry. No, no. I mean, I, Ross is, I agree with Ross on that completely. And I, again, it comes down to what you're going to use the tool, the data for. It's, I, I, I'll give a good example. If you're running a, if I'm running a world-class driver and he, and I say, and he says, man, the car's really good on entry, no problems with the back of the car, um, good stability, da, da, da. My, my brain goes, well, maybe we can take some wing out of it and reduce some drag and go quicker in a straight line. All right, good, because the car's secure and everything like that. And I say to the driver, hey, what do you think? Can we take some drag out of it? And he says, heck yeah, no, the thing's great. And so, okay, now there's five ways I can do that. Now's where the data comes in into play. I can take some wing out. I can raise the rear of the car. I can take some front splitter out, take some dive planes off. I can do all these certain things, but each one of those is going to affect the suspension, the packer gaps, the um, dynamic ride height, all of that. So now I'm going to use the data to go engineeringly discover what the most efficient way I can change the car, try to keep as much downforce as possible, but reduce the drag at the same time and try to keep the center of pressure the same so that the balance is the same. You can only do that with the data. That's the only way to look at it. You can't ask the driver, well, what do you think? Should I take, you know, should I take a degree of wing out and also go to the smaller front dive planes? Or should I, and he's going to be, I don't care, make it less draggy, but keep the balance the same. And that's where the, I have to look at the data to come up with the answer to that. And so at that level, it becomes now an in pure engineering tool, but it didn't drive what we were trying to do. It drove how we're going to achieve the goal we want to achieve most efficiently. Huh. Interesting. And, and, and to go back to Greg's question of, you know, Data never lies. 
and uh, uh, data cannot lie. <laughs> but <laughs> but in terms of finding the solution of how do we go faster, uh, I don't know if the if it's it's not exactly lying, but sometimes the data is going to say, yeah, take rear wing out of the car, and technically in simulation and everything else, the car could go faster. But if you have a driver out there who is now scared, and maybe scared is an exaggeration, but if the driver isn't confident, 99.9% of the time, the car is going to go slower. For sure. So even though the data says do this and it is correct, it's not the full picture. And having a driver that's confident and trusting the car, you're going to go better. Yep. I think uh, so, so we unfortunately have to move on to the next question so we don't run out of time, but I want to close this with one more thing. One final question on this question. How, and again, forgive me, this might actually be a loaded question. I've said the word question about 4,000 times now, but how, how often have you seen drivers who are not confident in a quicker car go out there and do impressive, wonderful, quick things like I know confidence is important. I know it's critical, but at past a certain level, if somebody's good enough, can they get in the car and have no confidence in it and then go screw it anyway and then send it and it gets there? Yep. For a lap. Really? Really? Yeah. Uh, oh yeah. For a for, lap? Is that what you said? Yeah. For a lap. No, yeah, I've I'm, seen that happen. Wow. And the, yeah. That's confidence, not in the car. That's confidence in their ability not to roll the thing over and burst into flames for a lap <laughs> because they know that they, Man. yeah, it's going to be, it's going to be uncomfortable. It's going to be no confidence. It's going to be loose getting in, but I got new tires and it's qualifying and I got to do it. And if it does all of those things, I can catch it. I may blow the lap for lap time, but I can catch it. So they have confidence, supreme confidence in themselves, but not in the car. Yeah, I, I agree that that a driver, uh, uh, an extremely capable uh, driver, an elite level driver can do it for a short period of time, yep. but even they will eventually suffer. And my mind immediately goes to somebody like Daniel Ricardo, who lost confidence in a car and the, the car was not bad and the data was saying, do all this stuff, but he lost confidence in his ability to do what was necessary in that car and it your toast. hurt his career. Yeah. Now, you know, I, I would say, you know, he got back into another car and that suited him and got his confidence back and it changed everything. Yep. Huh. I'm yep. not yep. saying, you know, he's at that level that he was before, but he was definitely higher than he was when he was at McLaren. Yep. Is the fall it's, off, I mean, assuming that if I lose confidence, the fall off is massive, 20%, 10%, 40%, whatever it is. Is the fall off smaller when you get to people with extreme skill? Is it like, I don't know. I mean, Ricardo loses confidence and, well, I guess we can measure some of that. But somebody, somebody at the top level in IMSA and they lose, they're in a car that they have zero confidence in and pass that first lap when they get into the second and third and things really just hot mess and they don't believe in it. Is that fall off, are we talking like, little bits or is it massive and it gets bigger and the slope increases? I think that it doesn't matter because, really? because, because it's just falling off. Well, if, if Daniel Ricardo is 0.01% off yeah. in formula one, that's 15th place. Right. <laughs> Makes yeah. sense. So, so yeah, you know, further up uh, the, the field tends to compress as well. Yeah. yeah. That makes sense. So that brings us to our next question, um, which is relevant to ordinary people and probably a lot of people who are not at entry level skill. Anyway, it comes from Billy it says, take some time. And instead of coaching me as my weekend warrior track driver, that's in air quotes, coach my family and friends that come to the track with me and want to help. What are the most effective questions and activities they can do and ask? To me, besides how was that session or how fast did you go? Point being to really help me in the get in the right headspace as well as doing the right setup changes. It's interesting, right? I, I never went to racetracks with, with family because they didn't want to be there, but I guess some people do. <laughs> yeah. Uh, 
So the first thing is, I think it's really cool that Billy's asking this question because uh, somebody, somebody who knows absolutely nothing about driving on a track can actually be very helpful. Uh, I had an experience that related to this in that there was a point many years ago where I was asked to come in and help my nephew's lacrosse team. I'd never held a lacrosse stick or a <laughs> lacrosse ball in my life, but I asked dumb questions and uh, the dumb questions had people going, oh yeah. So I think the first thing is encourage whoever, your friends, your family, whatever, uh, encourage your friends and family to ask questions. And you know, ideally they're not going to ask, hey, why do you suck so bad? Why are you so slow? Uh, but <laughs> But even if Which they say, clearly you haven't met my friends. <laughs> <laughs> well, see, I don't have friends, so uh, I, I don't know what that experience is like. But I think that uh, even somebody saying, why are you so much slower in turn three than the other cars that are out there? Well, you know, kind of going back to what if I didn't have any data? Uh, so now I'm just looking at uh, like, well, where am I losing time to everybody else? Somebody standing in a corner going, oh, turn three, you're slower than the other cars that are out there. So sometimes just having somebody who just gets you to think, and I, I'm going to say that's probably the most important part. Somebody asking you yep. some questions of, why do you, why do you break there? What do you, why do you carry that much speed to that corner? Why do you use all that track or why do you not use all the track there? And just have you, uh, to help build your awareness of what's going on and, you know, uh, my whole approach to coaching is first of all, you got to identify where the problem is, but then you've got to clarify it. So you can have somebody, you know, you can say, I feel like I'm, you know, you could say to your friend or your family, you could say, I feel like I'm, I'm not breaking as well in term one as some other people. I'm not breaking as late as they are. And they could actually go out to that corner and stand there and go, actually, it looks to me like you're doing the same thing as everybody else is. Or, yeah, you're breaking way earlier than everybody else. So sometimes it's help getting somebody to kind of help clarify you, cl clarify it for you. But the other part of that is then you could say, somebody could say, well, you seem to be breaking earlier than everybody else. And, and then you go, yeah, you're right. But when I break later, I just feel like I'm not getting slowed down early enough. Oh, wonder if maybe I'm not breaking hard enough initially. Yep. It, it starts and the whole then, process. Oh, okay. Yeah. Yeah. So just getting them to help you clarify what the real problem is can be super valuable. And, yep. you know, and, and, and one other thing, uh, have somebody ask you this question, what are you doing well? <laughs> because I think that's a question that not enough drivers ask themselves. They're so focused on everything that they're doing wrong or not well enough that they forget about what they're doing right and just saying what's what? working and just get you talking and thinking about it yeah. um, is is super valuable. I have Ross's question about what what are you doing well uh, is I kind of have the opposite question that I would say his friend should ask him because maybe these guys don't know a lot about racing, right? Like Ross said, maybe they're that have been to a race. They're just helping them unload the trailer and then getting them a sandwich at, between sessions. Cool. But they can certainly ask after every session when their spouse, friend, whatever comes in after a session and just say, so what frustrates you the most about driving the car? You don't have to ask like, what corner do you feel uncomfortable in? What, uh, you know, are you happy in the high speed? You don't have to get technical. Just like, what frustrates you? Because everybody probably does a task and they're like, come to top of mind, like, okay, I'm done with that task. Oh man. Well, oh man, <laughs> what, what is it? What is the thing? <laughs> and it might be simply like, man, I just, uh, turned one. I, I tried it a hundred different ways and it never seems right. It just frustrates me so much. Great. Now, like Ross said, we've identified the problem and I, especially with beginner drivers, 
what frustrates you the most is usually what makes them the slowest. It's what is. Yeah. And so if we can figure out collectively why it frustrates them and maybe come up with some ideas on what to change, then you can go work on it. But that thing, you know, I, I think especially some drivers who are starting to get into it and maybe they have data, maybe they have friends helping who know a little bit more about it. They get caught up in trying to be too technical and trying to, well, I don't know, maybe it's pitching too much. No, I don't know what really pitching is. Uh, maybe it's understeering, but I don't know. I have to look at the data, but I don't know if five degrees is too much or 10 degrees is too I don't know. And they get caught up in all of that. No, just what frustrates you? What do you, oh, I, I hate that part about my car or my driving. Just ask that question. I would have, I would say that should be a go-to question for, uh, Ross, I know you know, almost every driver debrief sheet, even at a pro level, at the end of the session, they come in and they write all their notes for the engineer. There's always a line someplace. What is the single one thing you want improved? Which yeah. is essentially what frustrates you. Yeah. And I guarantee every engineer gravitates toward that sentence first because if they can fix that, they'll go faster. It's it's an interesting interesting question for a number of reasons. But one of the things that I keep coming back to, you know, I joked earlier about my family not coming to the races, like you know, my dad did, obviously, but my sister and my mom weren't really interested in it. And what what I remembered while you were talking was there there were a couple of times where one or two of them ended up there, and it was always it was always funny watching them watch races. And I, I talked to my mom about it at one point, and she was like, "Well, I don't really know what's happening, and you know, clearly that guy's in front, and that person's behind them, and." You know, that's clear car A is clearly going through turn one faster than the other one. But the, the notion that it takes, in some cases, it can take prior knowledge and context to understand what's going on at a racetrack. So I guess, Ross, the question is, and Jeff, too, you know, if you're if you've got somebody there who you want them to be a part, you want them to care, you want them to know what's going on, and also enjoy it. So they're not just watching, you know, it's like I'm going to go in the other room and play tennis, stare at this wall. Right. It's, it's have them be a part of it. What do you, what would you tell them to look for? They're standing tracks, watching you go around and around, and it just looks like you're doing, driving in circles over and over again. How do you, how do you nudge somebody in the direction of figuring out what's going on and then being able to ask those questions? What's, what would you tell them? So the first thing, and, and I'm going to answer this in sort of two steps, I think. One is another question that I think is super valuable, and it will lead to the answer to the second question, is explain to me what you're doing. <laughs> and if I ask you, explain to me, like, what are all the things that you do uh, as you drive around the track? And, and you know, uh, a, a good friend of both Jeff and I uh, is the NHRA top fuel drag racer, Clay Milliken. Oh, and wow. Uh, I went out to a drag race with him because we were talking about mental game of driving. And, and, you know, at that time they were still running the quarter mile and doing 330 miles an hour, some crazy thing. Which and, they're now doing a thousand feet. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and I, and I said, Clay, explain to me what you do in four seconds. And it took 20 minutes for him to explain what he did in four <laughs> seconds. But what I learned from that was, I mean, first of all, it was just plain fascinating and then it was entertaining. And then it was, uh, I, I learned something from it. So I think if you have a friend or family member come to the track, have them ask you, explain to me what you do as you go around the track. I think it's going to help them get a better feel or understanding of what's going on. So that if you're saying, well, when I come into the corner, I actually think about how I take my foot off the brake pedal, because then I can get the car to kind of arc my way into the corner. and Maybe the next time you're standing on that corner in turn three and you're watching that, you can see how some cars kind of just, it's like they're carving a, a turn as opposed to skittering around the corner kind of thing. And if the, if you've explained that, explain that to them, it's going to help them be better observers. And by the way, there's a huge, massively important side effect to this is if I sit here and I spend 20 minutes explaining to you everything that I do in a minute and 30 drive around the track, I have just cemented or re or programmed that into my brain that much stronger. Right. So it's right. going to make me a better driver. Matt. Yeah. I, 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 
I, I agree. And and just so everybody who doesn't know Ross, who's listening, knows, there's no one better at standing alongside a racetrack, watching cars go through corners and being able to dissect what drivers are doing without a data trace or anything, looking at the whole field of like, he's currently coaching LMP2 driver, looking at the whole field and watching a session. And you could go to Ross and say, so tell me about each one. And he'll give you this amazingly detailed description of what each car is doing, what each driver is doing. That guy's on the brake. He, he pops off the brake. That guy hangs on the brake too long. That guy's late to throttle. Da, 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 da. He can watch, he can see all of that by standing at, at trackside. That's a lost art. I think Carol Smith one time <laughs> told me that race engineers need to get out of the pits and go to the side of the racetrack and watch their cars go around the racetrack and they would learn a lot more. <laughs> and so maybe like Ross is saying, yeah. get your friends to go up there and watch the cars and try to understand what they're doing. And when you're at a level with street cars, there's a lot more dynamics going on. There's a lot more movement to the car. So it's a little easier to see the differences between the cars. If you're in a LMP2 car, they just go whipping around the corner. It's with got so much downforce, it's harder to see, but that would be get them to go out and just say, okay, here's the thing. Tell me the biggest differences you see in my car versus the other ones in my class. And then <laughs> you could try to figure out why, because it's a lost art. There's, you know, Ross is, Ross I, is I have to, the best. <laughs> I have to note here, Ross, that we were talking earlier about you being Canadian and Jeff just gave you a compliment, which means you are genetically obligated to say, I'm sorry. And I'm I feel sorry, like, Jeff. You, there you <laughs> go. You, oh, him. Jeff, yeah, I, yeah. Mm, yeah, he is. Yeah. Yeah. But that, that's interesting, right? The, you know, you, you mentioned streetcars, but not just streetcars, a lot of club race cars, you know, are sprung and damped softly enough that you can yep. see body motion. I remember the first, first real track dad did going out and standing, standing on the inside of the first corner. And watching people, you know, at that point I'd read Ross's book and Tarifi's book and Frere's book and Jenkinson's book and all these things about brake release and how important it is and how, you know, managing weight transfer in the car as it bends into the corner and as it changes state matters massively. And I was like, yeah, okay, cool. That, that, that's, that's the thing. Sure. And then I watched three, you know, identically set up cars go through the same corner at what they hoped was the same speed. And you could watch the nose pop on the two people were just leaping off the brake pedal and the you know, notes of the car would just go bang up and gain like, you know, an instant, you could see it tracks. It was like half an inch, an inch of travel as the person picked up the throttle and it came off the brake and pick up the throttle. And the fact that, that stuff is, can, is so often obvious, even in club cars. I don't, I mean, the fact that Ross, you can see it on a, on a P2 cars, kind of remarkable. Um, also, I just gave you another compliment. You have to say, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Thank you. I'm sorry. Thank you. There You're you go. welcome. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> so, Sam, it's a, it's a great point, though. I mean, one of the things that I look for in a, in a production-based car is yeah. I just look at the, the gap between the fender and the top of the tire or, you know, the, where it is at the top of the wheel. And you just look at that gap and you watch that gap change. And that helps you get that idea of how much the you know front of the car is diving and then popping back up again. But then you go and you watch open wheel cars and you just compare the tire to the chassis and you compare that movement. And then you watch it in a, you know, a prototype car where you've got some combination of those two things. But obviously in that, you know, uh, an Indy car or a, a GTP or LMP2 car or something like that, the movement is much smaller. But if you calibrate yourself by watching, Betty. you know, some... Uh, softer production-based cars, and then you keep getting closer and closer. Eventually, you go, oh, I can notice that tiny little bit of movement in the chassis. And, you know, sometimes, yeah, you'll come back and you'll, you know, I'll come back to Jeff and go, Jeff, you know, I noticed, you know, our car does this <laughs> and their car does that. And, you know, you kind of just notice some little different there. And, you know, hopefully that's some information to Jeff to go, oh, they're doing something different with the dampers on the car. Yep. I like it. I, for people who aren't watching the video, one of Ross's hands, when he said this, went up and went wiggle, wiggle, wiggle. And when he said that, another hand went up and went wiggle, wiggle, waggle. And that's very <laughs> different. And if you've ever stepped inside of a racetrack, you know the difference. And yep. if you haven't, I'm sorry, it doesn't make any sense. But that's your your point about you know gradually building into these things. It's like anything else. You can't jump into 
It's the reason that there are ladder series. It's the reason that you start. Uh, my daughter is starting to learn. She's 10 years old, starting to learn coding, which she's using block and writing software is using big chunks of pre-written software to start it and put it together instead of writing things from scratch. It's the reason we start with anything with the big, broad, easy brush strokes, as opposed to the really, really hard detail stuff. And that's, yeah. I think that's one of the things that we tend to beat ourselves up on and forget. And you, you told me this at one point, Ross, I, I, I was talking about not having been in a race car for a year or something like that. You said, well, you know, if you, if you played tennis once a year, would you beat yourself up for being terrible at it that one time a year? And I think the same thing stands for, you know, if, if you haven't been through the learning curve on anything, if you haven't given yourself the proper time to ramp into something, it doesn't matter how talented you are. The length of that ramp may be different, but it's still important. And that, that's really interesting because to go back yep. to what Jeff was saying earlier, but the first question, all of this is just it's a calibrated way to figure out how to solve problems. And it's open, giving yourself the right answer. I yep. think it's really interesting. I think the, I think the, the big thing is it's Ross always, mm -hmm. both, both of us, I think have kind of a foundation of what we do working with drivers is ask questions. So I would tell, sure. yes. you know, if I was Billy, I would tell my friends, my family, just ask questions, whatever pops up. Like, why do you always check your tire pressures before you go out. Well, now Billy's got to explain why he does that. And maybe he doesn't know exactly why, but he's going to now have to think about it and explain it. And if it's something complicated, like why does that one car always, uh, the front end always jumps up in the middle of the corner. Now Billy's going to Daddy, why to... do you crash every lap? <laughs> <laughs> well, that could be one too. Why did you crash? But I mean, it. don't overthink it have those people come in and ask the questions that intrigue them the most. Because yeah. if you, there was a time my, I was 10 or 11, whatever I was. And I started to get really super into reading engineering books, Carol Smith's books and all of that kind of stuff, aerodynamic books, things like that. And I would, my dad would ask me about it and say, okay, we'll explain ground effects. And I'd be like, and I start to explain and he would be like, ah, no, it doesn't make any sense. Da, 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 da. And then I, he'd go, explain it to me again, two days later. And I would explain it better and better. And he would go, okay, now go explain it to your mom. And my mom was <laughs> smart. She's college educated lady. She was a very smart lady, but could care less about ground effects or aerodynamics. And he said, if you can explain it to her in three minutes and she goes, oh, I get that. Then you she know your subject. And I use that as my, my standard. And so if Billy can explain it to his buddy in easily, so his buddy that never been to a race can understand it, then he knows it. Ross kind of talked about that before. You're going to learn something while you explain it. You're going to learn your lap and what you do. You're going to learn that. So learn how to explain it to your buddy, but make sure they're asking questions all the time. Just ask questions. Whatever intrigues them will benefit you. And, and one of the things that I always think about whenever I'm talking about driving is I got to, I'm pretending that I'm explaining it to a 10 year old. Mm -hmm. So, uh, so you have to explain it in, in a very, very simple way. Now I know there is, if I was talking to you, Jeff, when you were 10, you probably, you probably would have uh, like, well, <laughs> right. tell me about the, uh, what, yeah, whatever. I was, <laughs> the I was coefficient of, uh, yeah. Um, <laughs> But so, so, you know, explain it, uh, explain it as if you're talking to a 10 year old, but also again, asking, ask them to ask you questions and remember there are no dumb questions. Oh, snap. Wow. I, yeah. I, I was thinking about this. You said, explain it like, like I'm 10. There's a, uh, I, I'm of the right age that I spend a lot of time on Reddit, you know, basically looking at cat pictures and <laughs> stupid short videos of other stupid things, but there's a subreddit. Uh, a su subsection within Reddit called explain like I'm five, ELI five. And sometimes people, people will ask things like, well, you know, how does the, how does the jet stream work? How does a turbine engine work? And some of, some people are very, very good at, at explaining these things. And some people do these really complex explanations that don't go anywhere. But nine times out of 10, the stuff that floats to the top is actually a pretty good version of the explanation you would give a five-year-old. And I, I think the lesson, the lesson here is to always watch your audience because I, I, read these things and 
a lot of times I'll sit there and I'll just go, okay, yeah. Um, is there a, is there a way you can explain that to me? Like I'm, I'm three. Cause that didn't work for me. <laughs> the notion that ultimately like it's, it's all about figuring out what's going to make somebody care about it. And you know, that's, that's different for everybody. Yeah. Yeah. On that note, we are, we are wrapped on this week's version of it's not the car installment and it's not the car. And we are wrapped on this week's installment of no time questions. And we have a small announcement. So we love doing this version of this show. But we're going to keep doing it. We've done two no dumb questions since we started It's Not the Car in January. These will keep happening. We're going to do one, sometimes two a month. They will live, they're going to live as bonus episodes, which means if you'd like access to them, all you have to do is go in, join our Patreon for a few bucks, and we'll give you access to all of our bonus episodes. They'll start stacking. We already have a couple in the hopper. They're just going to keep going and going and going. No dumb questions are going to be in that file. There'll also be a couple other special weird little stories. There's one where Jeff and I talk about Dan Gurney. There's one where Jeff and I talk about uh, other weird, fun, technical things that I can tell you about, but I can't remember what they are now. Be professional. And... Other than that, it's a really great way to help support the show. It helps us stay on air. And we we love you and we love doing no dumb questions, but we also have so much else we want to do with the main feed on It's Not the Car, and this lets us do both. So check that out if you'd like to support the show. Again, that's our Patreon. It's patreon.com forward slash not the car. And if you get a chance beyond that, uh, please Take a look at the show's page on Apple or Spotify or wherever you listen to your podcasts. Please leave a review and a rating, follow the show, tell your friends. That stuff really does help us. And we, frankly, we also love and need the feedback. We want to know what you like, what you don't like, what we could be doing different, what we shouldn't change at all, how many times a show Ross should be sorry. These things actually matter. And we're really glad you're listening. Thanks for listening. Thanks. Have fun. Thanks, everyone. Remember, the no dumb questions and no dumb feedback either. <laughs> that's, that's the other thing about no dumb, no dumb questions is that every no dumb question ends with saying, have fun. And I always like that because yeah. you should. Yeah. If you're not having fun, why are you doing it? Exactly. See you next week. Have fun. <laughs> <laughs>